For thousands of years, the ancestors of Hawaiians traversed vast oceans. They made countless journeys and discovered many islands. They developed a sophisticated navigation system using the stars, currents, and winds. Their skills and persistence led them to discover one of the most remote locations on Earth, the islands of Hawaii. These volcanic islands were a sanctuary in the middle of the Pacific. Early voyagers found that Hawaii possessed ample water, fertile soil, and seas teeming with life. They built their communities and established intricate systems that sustained their people. They planted a sophisticated patchwork of varied agricultural crops where those crops would thrive. Where streams were present, they were channeled into taro fields, collecting rich nutrients as they flowed towards the sea. These nutrient-rich waters nourished the fish in fish ponds built along the shore and fed the fish in the coastal areas. Early Hawaiians created magnificent works of art. They developed an extensive body of oral literature. They maintained an effective government that assured the abundance of the aina, the land. They were experts in engineering and food production. Their adaptability and resourcefulness enabled the islands to sustain a large population of some 800,000 people. Early Hawaiian society provided structure and stability. Hawaiian tradition maintained a centralized and unified government while allowing decision-making at the local level. Each of Hawaii's main islands was divided into districts called Ahupua'a. These lands were cared for by the makainana, or people, and managed by an ali'i, or chief. Each Ahupua'a was part of a larger area, or moku, that was managed by regional ali'i. Several moku comprised an island, or mokupuni, Paramount Ali'i Nui or sovereign chiefs ruled over one or more Mokupuni. Together, these Ali'i formed the Council of Chiefs. The chiefs understood their role in governing the people and the lands. They understood the familial connections that cross multiple generations and land divisions. They knew the value of alliances and maintaining strong relations with each other. They were trained to know when to use diplomacy and when to engage in warfare. By the early 1800s, a supreme Ali'i Nui emerged. His name was Kamehameha. Hawaii's new king was a keen visionary and strategist. He united Hawaii under one kingdom, to ensure the peace and prosperity of all Hawaiians. In the years under King Kamehameha's reign, Hawaii flourished. The island's abundance drew many foreigners to Hawaii's shores, and with them came change. Some changes were welcomed, like new food crops and metal tools. Other changes were devastating, like diseases that led to unprecedented suffering and death. Other problems involved the typical clash of rules and social norms when different cultures meet. Under the strong rule of King Kamehameha, order was maintained. Kamehameha knew that peace was fragile. And he came to know that powerful nations were taking over large regions of the world, often by force. Kamehameha understood that other nations would want to control Hawaii. To protect the Hawaiian kingdom, Kamehameha established friendly ties with Great Britain, the largest world power of the day. He did this through Captain George Vancouver. On one of Captain Vancouver's visits to the islands, he presented King Kamehameha with a British flag 
and set in motion plans to have Hawaii placed under British protection. Kamehameha accepted this offer and raised the flag over his own residence to confirm the intended relationship. With this act, the first international alliance was initiated. Kamehameha ruled until his death in 1819. His son, Liholiho, became King Kamehameha II. Many deaths from foreign diseases and other Western influences led Liholiho and the Council of Chiefs to question Hawaiian traditions. They began to adopt new ideas. One of the biggest changes involved religion. Soon after, when American missionaries arrived in the islands, they advised the Li'i that Hawaii would gain respect among foreign countries if it became a Christian nation. Hawaiian laws began to incorporate Christian ideals. The highest of Ali'i were baptized. Certain Hawaiian traditions were suppressed. Hula was banned because the missionaries considered it lewd and sinful. Later, King Liholiho set sail for Great Britain with his queen and high chiefs Boki and Kanehua. His goal was to solidify his father's strategic alliance with Britain and to strengthen Hawaii's position among foreign nations. The king and his entourage were received with grandeur. They were hosted by royal attendants and honored with seats in the English king's royal box at ballet and opera performances. Tragically, while in London, King Liholiho and his queen contracted measles. They did not live to meet the King of England. Instead, Chiefs Boki and Kanehoa met with King George IV, who confirmed Great Britain's continued protection of the Hawaiian Kingdom. The diplomatic journey was a success, but the return home was somber. The Hawaiian people mourned the loss of their king and queen as the Kingdom of Hawaii continued its efforts to secure a place in the world. Upon Liholiho's passing, his younger brother Kauikeuli was installed as King Kamehameha III. Kauikeuli reigned for nearly 30 years. He believed education was critical to strengthening the Hawaiian kingdom. Kauikeuli proclaimed, Heopuni Palapala Koku, mine is a kingdom of education. The king knew that literacy and education were essential for the well being of his people. He saw the potential power of Hawaiian as a written language. Hawaiians were eager to learn. Under Kauikeuli's reign, with the aid of missionaries, the Ali'i established a school system for all Maka'ainana Hawaii citizens. This included a college that trained native educators so they in turn could teach others. Hawaii's people were enthusiastic readers. Hawaiian language newspapers thrived. Hawaiians consumed thousands of pages of political debates, news, and Hawaiian literature. They also translated into the Hawaiian language articles and creative works from around the world. Virtually 100% of Hawaiians could read and write. Hawaii became one of the most literate nations in the world. Hawaiians were a highly educated people who adapted and excelled even in a changing world. King Kauikeuli's efforts in education and the enthusiasm of the Hawaiian people made them among the most educated 
in the world. Kaui Keoli's call for literacy strengthened the Hawaiian kingdom within. However, there was still a need to secure Hawaii's status in the international arena. The king assembled his ali'i council and his most trusted foreign advisors. Together, they created the Declaration of Rights. The declaration reaffirmed the ancient roles of the king and the ali'i to ensure the well-being of Hawaii's people. The next year, Hawaii's leaders issued Hawaii's first constitution. The constitution maintained the council of chiefs chosen by the king. It was called the House of Nobles. The constitution also preserved the tradition of island chiefs appointed by the king. They were now called governors. Local district ali'i maintained their function, but instead of being chosen by the king, they were elected. Collectively, they were referred to as the House of Representatives. The Constitution also established a judicial branch of government with district and Supreme Court judges. A Department of Taxation was created. These measures helped to formalize Hawaii's modern status. With the Constitution well implemented, Kaui Keoli began to send representatives to meet with heads of state across the globe. Their mission, to secure formal acknowledgement of the Hawaiian Kingdom's sovereignty by world powers. Timoteo Ha'alilio, William Richards, and George Simpson were chosen for this important task. Ha'alilio was a high-ranking ali'i in the House of Nobles. Richards was an American who had resigned from his missionary post to work full-time for the kingdom. Simpson, from Great Britain, worked for the Hudson Bay Company. Ha'alilio and Richards traveled to the United States to meet with Secretary of State Daniel Webster. Webster offered President Tyler's verbal assurance that the United States would recognize the independence of the Hawaiian Kingdom. Later, Simpson joined Ha'alilio and Richards on their diplomatic visits to London, France, and Belgium. The King's men worked hard, traveling far and wide to gain formal recognition of the Hawaiian Kingdom's sovereignty. Meanwhile, unbeknownst to them, their counterparts in Hawaii were in great peril. By the early 1800s, foreigners began flocking to the islands and making demands for aina, land. This caused serious problems. While foreigners thought in terms of land ownership, Hawaiians lived according to land stewardship. In Hawaiian tradition, aina is the embodiment of the gods. Aina sustains life. For Hawaiians, no one could own Aina, just as no one could own the gods. The traditional land management system gave native Hawaiian citizens, or Hoa Aina, rights to the Aina to support their families. Everyone had rights to Aina. In this system, the king was the caretaker of all Aina. He decided how the Aina was used and what was best for the people. When foreigners arrived, the ali'i allowed them to live in the islands. Eventually, they wanted to build homes and stores, and they wanted to own the land. In 1842, foreigner Richard Charlton declared he was the owner of waterfront land in Honolulu. He claimed that High Chief Kalanimoku, now deceased, had granted him the land. King Kauikiauli did not agree, noting that he, as king, was the ultimate authority over the Aina. Charlton notified Lord George Paulet, a British warship commander. Lord Paulet acted outside his sphere of authority and made demands on the king. 
insisting the land be given to Charlton. Paulet declared that his warship would open fire on Honolulu and claim Hawaii as a territory of Great Britain if the king did not comply. With these threats, Kaui Keoli stepped aside under protest to Great Britain. Paulet then lowered the Hawaiian flag and raised the British flag over the islands. King Kaui Keoli quickly sent an emissary to London. He trusted that British authorities would undo Paulette's actions and honor their agreement to respect Hawaii's sovereign independence. Meanwhile, Paulette sent a representative to argue his case. The fate of the Hawaiian kingdom rested in London. The diplomatic relations nurtured by Hawaiian ali'i proved crucial after Lord Paulette's attempt to take over Hawaii. Ha'alileo, Richards, and Simpson had already begun a conversation with Lord Aberdeen, the British Secretary of State for Foreign Affairs, regarding Hawaii's independence. Many Americans opposed a British-controlled Hawaii. Honoring President Tyler's pledge to the Hawaiian Kingdom, U.S. Secretary of State Daniel Webster ordered the American minister in London to intervene. After numerous correspondences, British officials ruled in favor of the Hawaiian Kingdom. On July 31, 1843, a ceremony was held in Honolulu. British Admiral Richard Thomas took down the British flag, formally restoring Hawaii's independence and Kaui Keoli's rule as king. The kingdom celebrated in grand fashion. Crowds gathered at Kawaiahao Church, where Kaui Keoli proclaimed, Wamaukea o kaaina i kapono. The sovereignty of the land is perpetuated through righteousness. For Hawaiian Ali, the events of 1843 were a powerful reminder of the importance of maintaining strong diplomatic relations and behaving righteously. The resolution of the Paulet affair would set a course of action in future events. While King Kaui Keoli was addressing the Paulette affair, emissaries Ha'alileo, Williams, and Simpson were making progress in Europe. Their efforts culminated on November 28, 1843, when France and Great Britain formally recognized the sovereign independence of the Hawaiian Kingdom. This joint agreement was signed by designees of Queen Victoria of Great Britain and King Louis-Philippe of France. With this Anglo-French proclamation, Hawaii became the first non-European country to join the Family of Nations. The Family of Nations was an influential group of countries that recognized each other's equal sovereign status. After Britain and France recognized Hawaii's sovereignty, other countries in the Family of Nations followed suit. The United States declared its full recognition of the independence of the Hawaiian Kingdom. This was confirmed by the appointment of U.S. Commissioner George Brown, stationed in Hawaii. Members of the Family of Nations agreed to live by the Law of Nations. These laws described how nations should behave toward each other. Under the Law of Nations, it is wrong for a nation to use military force against a peaceful nation. Similarly, it is unlawful for a nation to bring its military into another's territory without cause. The law of nations required member nations to honor the laws, but there was no way to enforce these laws. If a nation chose to break the law and overrun a smaller country, other nations could offer help. But if no other nations came to its aid, 
the smaller nation was on its own. After the temporary loss of the kingdom in 1843, King Kawikeoli realized Hawaii was in a vulnerable position. He knew he could be overthrown by a world power. And if he were overtaken, all of Hawaii's land would be controlled by another nation. Kawikeoli knew more land disputes were likely to occur. Issues related to the Aina would need to be addressed to discourage a repeat of the Paulette affair. King Koi Keauli had done a great deal to confirm Hawaii's independence in the world, but there was still much more to do. After the Paulette affair, King Kawikeoli sought to safeguard the Hawaiian kingdom from foreign takeover. He devised a plan to protect the Aina and help his people maintain control over the land. Traditionally, Hawaiians shared a given area of land. Everyone had rights to the Aina, and everyone had their responsibility to care for a portion. Ultimately, all lands were subject to the king's authority and management. The king and the council of chiefs worked with trusted foreign advisors to consider a new land system. They decided that the Aina was to be divided among many individuals rather than being concentrated under the king. The land commission was formed to Mahele or divide the Aina among people who held rights to the land. This new set of laws was called the Mahele. In this Mahele, about one-third of the Aina became crown lands, which were owned by the reigning monarch. About one-third of the Aina became government lands. The other third or so of the Aina was retained by the Ali. All Aina was to be shared with Hoa Aina, the aboriginal Hawaiian citizens who had lived on the land for generations. According to the Mahele, land could be claimed by Hoa'aina as privately owned parcels. These privately owned parcels could be sold to anyone, including foreigners. King Kawikeoli believed these changes would protect Hawaiian stewardship of the Aina. Treating the Aina as a commodity was a significant shift in government policy with far-reaching consequences. The king knew the transition from sharing land to owning land would be difficult for Hawaiians. To help his people grow into these changes, Kawikeoli gave his people options. He allowed them to claim their rights to the Aina and receive private property at a time of their own choosing. There was no deadline. They could assume private ownership of their Aina whenever they wanted. If a family decided to wait to claim their land, they had other options. They could live on crown lands or government lands or on the lands of their regional ali'i, where they could continue to work the land and support themselves. Ultimately, about 5% of the land was either claimed or purchased by Hoa Aina as private parcels. However, a majority of Hoa Aina continued to share their land and resources. Traditional access and gathering rights remained intact under the Mahele. This meant, for instance, that a landowner had to allow access to established trails and resources on his property. Freshwater streams, springs, and beaches were shared resources that no one could own. Shared rights and responsibilities to the Aina connected Hawai'i's people to one another. Through these measures, King Kawikeoli sought to blend and balance traditional Hawaiian practices with land management that was more familiar to foreign powers. However, many foreigners did not respect this hybrid system. They often refused to honor the shared rights of Hoa'aina. This was an issue that would continue for years to come. A 
Upon Kauikeoli's passing, Alexander Liholiho became King Kamehameha IV. Together with Queen Emma, Liholiho focused his attention on the well-being of his people. Hawaiians had been decimated by foreign disease. More than 90% of the population had perished. The king and queen made healthcare a national priority. Their efforts resulted in the establishment of the Queen's Hospital. Alexander Liholiho continued to expand Hawaii's international standing. He strengthened the kingdom's ties with Great Britain by inviting the Anglican Church to Hawaii. He asked Queen Victoria to be the godmother of his son and heir, Prince Albert Kaleopapa. Queen Victoria agreed and sent a high-ranking bishop to Hawaii to christen the young prince and establish the church. Tragically, before the christening day, Prince Albert died. A year later, Alexander Liho Liho passed, leaving his brother, Lot Kapuaiva, to serve as King Kamehameha V. Lot Kapuaiva continued to elevate Hawaii's international standing and the national and cultural pride of his people. He began the construction of St. Andrew's Cathedral. He commissioned the construction of a government building, a Liolanihale, and a national post office. He established Mauna Ala Royal Mausoleum to honor his ancestors. The king revived the practice of hula, thereby connecting his people to the wealth of knowledge stored in chants and dances. Under Lot Kapuiva's rule, the missionary influence ban on traditional herbal healing ended. Hawaiian healers were able to practice openly once again. Some were invited to serve on the Hawaiian Board of Medicine. Years later, Lot Kapuiva lay on his deathbed. He declined to assign an heir. The Constitution of the Hawaiian Kingdom directed that the legislature nominate and elect a new king. William Lunalilo was elected. The legislative vote was legal and appropriate, but Lunalilo declined to take the throne without a public election. William Lunalilo won the public vote and assumed the throne as Hawaii's first elected sovereign. King Lunalilo began his reign with strong public support. However, he soon faced serious economic challenges involving businesses in Hawaii. Before Lunalilo became king, whaling was a big business in Hawaii. But by the time of Lunalilo's coronation, petroleum was starting to replace whale oil, and whaling went into decline. At the same time, Hawaii's sugar industry was emerging. Foreign missionaries and businessmen were able to acquire land to grow large volumes of sugar cane. The U.S. market, with its convenient harbors along its west coast, was a likely market for sugar. But import taxes made Hawaii-grown sugar more costly and less attractive to U.S. buyers. King Luna Lilo supported a treaty with the United States so Hawaii sugar and other products could enter the United States tax-free and U.S. items could enter Hawaii tax-free. But the United States wanted more. U.S. negotiators pressed for the exclusive rights to use Pu'uloa, also known as Pearl Harbor. Hawaiians strongly objected. So Lunalilo withdrew from the negotiations. With his untimely passing, Lunalilo's brief reign ended without a free trade agreement with the United States. Lunalilo's elected successor was King David Kalakaua. Kalakaua saw the value of a free trade agreement with the United States. But like Lunalilo, 
he was not willing to offer exclusive rights to Pearl Harbor. A skilled diplomat, Kinkalakaua traveled to Washington, D.C. to negotiate a new treaty in person. Kinkalakaua was the first sovereign of any country to address Congress. Kalakaua affirmed that Pearl Harbor would be controlled by Hawaii, not the United States. He assured U.S. leaders the strategic location would not be used by any other countries. The treaty also stipulated that the United States and the Hawaiian Kingdom would strengthen and perpetuate friendly relations. <laughs> President Ulysses S. Grant agreed. The Reciprocity Treaty was official. As expected, the Reciprocity Treaty and Free Trade Agreement boosted sugar sales and profits. Sugar companies used the revenues to expand their operations. This growth provided much needed revenue and resources to modernize the Hawaiian Kingdom. Large roads, new harbors, and railroads were constructed to facilitate transportation. However, this new prosperity did not extend to Hoa'aina. Lands that once sustained Hoa'aina were converted to sugar fields. People were forced off the land and no longer had access to basic necessities provided by their aina. The Reciprocity Treaty boosted the sugar industry in Hawaii and helped to modernize the Hawaiian Kingdom. Unfortunately, one of its unintended effects was to begin to separate the Hoa'aina, people of the land, from their greatest resource, Aina. While Kalakaua was king, the Hawaiian kingdom prospered. He used treasury funds for his nation-building efforts. Following the elite tradition of diplomacy, Kalakaua set out on a global tour to forge ties with international leaders from Emperor Meiji of Japan to U.S. President Arthur to British Queen Victoria and even Pope Leo XIII. To support Hawaii's sugar industry, Kalakaua assured world leaders that Hawaii was a safe place for their growing populations to seek new homes and secure jobs. The result? Thousands of sugar laborers came to Hawaii's shores. Kalakaua's diplomacy abroad helped Hawaii establish a worldwide presence. The Kingdom of Hawaii eventually placed more than 90 legations and consulates across the world to assist with trade and diplomatic relations. Kalakaua journeyed far and wide to ensure that the Hawaiian Kingdom was recognized as a sovereign nation around the globe. Along with King Kalakaua's diplomatic travels abroad, he strengthened his people at home through culture and technology. Kalakaua believed that Hawaiian cultural traditions and practices were a top priority. Kalakaua assembled masters of Hawaiian genealogy and history. He made sure their knowledge was documented and recorded for future generations and he supported the practice of Hawaiian herbal healers. Kalakaua and his siblings were gifted composers. Their songs were heard throughout the kingdom. He sponsored the creation and performance of mele, songs and chants, and hula, and made them an integral part of state events. Kalakaua initiated construction projects befitting a strong and prosperous nation. Iolani Palace was a grand testament to the kingdom's standing in the world. Iolani Palace was the site of grand state dinners and events where the king and his queen Kapiolani hosted dignitaries from around the world. 
At night, the palace was illuminated with electric lights powered by a steam engine. This was years before the White House would be fitted with such amenities. Outside, people enjoyed evening strolls under the streetlights powered by the kingdom's first hydroelectric plant at Nu'uanu Stream. There was much for the Hawaiian people to take pride in. Kalakaua's social activities were a sophisticated form of diplomacy. Through these efforts, he enhanced his relations with foreign dignitaries and others of power and influence. The king's love of new technology and his gift for entertaining, performing music, and engaging in stimulating conversation earned him the nickname, the Merry Monarch. The Reciprocity Treaty secured by King Kalakaua enabled free trade of certain goods between Hawaii and the United States. The treaty generated new wealth in Hawaii and led to the boom years, especially for the sugar industry. When the treaty was nearing expiration, the United States repeated its demand for exclusive rights to Pearl Harbor. Despite the urgings of Hawaii sugar businessmen, Kalakaua refused. The king's refusal to give in to foreign pressures increased the tensions already growing in Hawaii. Foreigners and sugar businessmen in Hawaii criticized Kalakaua's ways of strengthening his kingdom. They frowned on traditions like hula, Hawaiian medicinal practices, and elaborate events at the royal palace. They favored exclusive use of Pearl Harbor for the United States. They decided to take action and created a political group known as the Reform Party. Many of the Reform Party's leaders were descendants of Protestant missionaries, and many were also members of the Honolulu Rifles. They made a plan to confront Kalakaua. Rifle club members surrounded the palace. Inside, the Reform Party demanded that King Kalakaua sign a new constitution. Under significant pressure, Kalakaua signed the document, which came to be known as the Bayonet Constitution. The king was also forced to dismiss his cabinet and replace them with members of the Reform Party. The Bayonet Constitution granted the cabinet veto power over the king's decisions. Kalakaua's political authority was diminished. Under the Bayonet Constitution, foreigners of American and European descent were allowed to vote in kingdom elections. With this shift in power, the Reform Party renewed the Reciprocity Treaty with a new clause granting the United States exclusive rights to use Pearl Harbor. The sugar businessmen now had a major stake in the economy of the Hawaiian Kingdom. King Kalakaua worked carefully to balance the needs of his people with the demands of business, but the use of force was taking its toll on the kingdom. King Kalakaua's passing left his sister and heir, Lili'uokalani, to deal with the bayonet constitution. As queen, Lili'uokalani traveled throughout the kingdom. Everywhere she went, she heard the same ardent requests. Her people wanted a new constitution. They wanted their voting power back. They wanted the powers of their sovereign leader to be fully restored. They wanted to limit foreign control of Hawaii. The people spoke and Lili'uokalani listened. She began drafting a new constitution. (laughs) 
Lili Wokalini worked tirelessly to create a new constitution. Unbeknownst to the queen, sugar businessmen and reform party members were working to undermine her efforts. They secretly made plans to take over the Hawaiian kingdom. Up to this point, the sugar industry was strong and profits were high. But growers were beginning to worry about lower profits. They feared that the Hawaiian kingdom would raise land leases or not renew the leases at all. They also worried about protecting their relationship with their largest customer, the United States. The US Congress had just passed the McKinley Tariff, which actually removed some tariffs. It allowed other countries to sell sugar to the U.S. tax-free and eliminated Hawaii's competitive advantage in the U.S. This new law also provided financial benefits for U.S. sugar growers. Hawaii sugar sales plummeted. The Hawaii sugar businessmen devised a plan to maintain their high profits and their financial relationship with the U.S to secure cheap long-term land leases they plotted to take over the Hawaiian kingdom government to regain their competitive edge in US markets they knew annexing Hawaii to the United States was crucial the powerful sugar businessmen in Hawaii had strong ties with US officials including the representative in Hawaii US minister John Stevens Stevens sought to expand the global influence of the United States. He wanted the U.S. to be on par with European nations that held large territories throughout the world. Stevens and other U.S. expansionists saw Hawaii as a prime acquisition. All they needed was an opportunity to seize it. Sugar businessmen and military supporters had been waiting for the opportunity to seize the Hawaiian kingdom. That opportunity came in January of 1893. Queen Liliuokalani was set to announce her new constitution to her people. In accordance with the existing constitution, she sought the approval of the cabinet. Liliuokalani had been led to believe that the cabinet supported the new constitution. However, on the very day it was to be announced, cabinet member Attorney General Arthur Peterson requested two weeks to draft revisions. The queen granted this unexpected request. Though disappointed, Liliuokalani urged her people to be patient and return to their homes and keep the peace. That same evening, sugar businessmen began to carry out their plan to overthrow the kingdom. They claimed Liliuokalani's attempt to change the constitution caused rampant unrest and chaos. They also claimed that they, the businesses, and their homes were in danger. They quickly formed a committee of safety and asked U.S. Minister Stevens to land troops from the USS Boston warship. All this was to protect Americans from dangers that did not exist. To counter the false claims, Liliuokalani and her cabinet ministers issued a public notice. It verified that the queen had followed proper procedures and emphasized that the new constitution was created in response to the people's requests. It also confirmed the enacting of the new constitution would follow the rules of the existing bayonet constitution. No laws were broken. No unjust actions were taken by the queen. However, the committee of safety was unrelenting. Their spokesman, Lauren Thurston, 
sent a letter to U.S. Minister Stevens. The letter repeated the false claims of danger and requested the protection of U.S. military forces. Stevens ordered a company of U.S. Marines from the USS Boston to land at 5 o'clock that evening. The troops marched straight into town and positioned themselves near Iolani Palace and Aliolani Hale. Far from the American homes and businesses the Committee of Safety claimed were endangered. This invasion was a direct challenge to the seat of government and was a clear violation of the law of nations. Although armed forces had settled near the palace, Queen Liliuokalani refused to engage them. Instead, she relied on diplomacy and expected that the United States would abide by the law of nations and retract their troops. She ordered her Minister of Foreign Affairs, Samuel Parker, to contact Stevens immediately. Parker stated, as the situation is one which does not call for interference on the part of the United States government, my colleagues and myself would most respectfully request of Your Excellency the authority upon which this action was taken. Stevens did not respond. The Hawaiian people took action. They flooded the area to join the Kingdom Marshal to oppose the invasion and defend their nation. Queen Liliuokalani did not want any blood shed on either side and instructed her people not to engage in battle. She believed that diplomacy would prevail. The next afternoon, the Committee of Safety stood on the back steps of Ali'iolani Hale within a stone's throw of Iolani Palace. They made a speech to a small group of people. They claimed that the Hawaiian kingdom was no longer. They declared a new provisional government was established until terms of a union with the United States could be agreed upon. U.S. Minister Stevens immediately acknowledged the provisional government as the actual government of the Hawaiian Islands. Together, they proclaimed that the Hawaiian kingdom had come to an end. U.S. Minister Stevens and the provisional government had no legal right to make these declarations. They had no control of any kingdom building, nor the kingdom's military. Most importantly, the kingdom's citizens did not support them. The provisional government, backed by the U.S. military, claimed that the Hawaiian Kingdom was no longer in charge. The Hawaiian Kingdom became a nation in distress. Queen Liliuokalani, who was well-versed in the law of nations, acted quickly. She recalled George Paulette's unauthorized takeover and how diplomatic actions had returned the kingdom to Hawaii's rightful sovereign. Liliuokalani issued a protest to the United States with the belief that John Stevens' wrongful acts would be corrected. On January 17, 1893, she wrote, I, Liliuokalani, by the grace of God and under the Constitution of the Hawaiian Kingdom, Queen, do hereby solemnly protest against any and all acts done against myself and the constitutional government of the Hawaiian Kingdom by certain persons claiming to have established a provisional government of and for this kingdom. Now, to avoid any collision of armed forces and perhaps the loss of life, I do this under protest and impelled by said force, yield my authority until such time as the government of the United States shall, 
upon facts being presented to it, undo the action of its representative, and reinstate me in the authority which I claim as the constitutional sovereign of the Hawaiian Islands. Liliuokalani soon discovered that plans to overthrow the kingdom had been in motion for some time. Her protest was clear, direct, and timely, but it fell on unreceptive ears. The Queen learned that U.S. President Benjamin Harrison supported acquiring new territories. She discovered that the U.S. Secretary of State, bolstered by reports of the strategic value of Hawaii, encouraged the U.S. invasion. She realized that Committee of Safety member Lauren Thurston, who helped promote false claims of chaos and danger in Honolulu, knew all along that the United States would support the provisional government and the invasion. Liliuokalani sent representatives to state the kingdom's case at the U.S. Capitol. However, the only passenger ship in port was controlled by sugar businessmen. They barred the Queen's representatives from sailing. Meanwhile, Thurston had set sail for Washington, D.C. to promote annexation of Hawaii to the U.S. Delayed, the Queen's men followed on the next available ship. But they arrived too late. President Harrison had already sent a treaty to Congress to consider annexing Hawaii. A lengthy debate ensued. Harrison's term ended without Congress making a decision. The new president, Grover Cleveland, heard Liliuokalani's recounting of the facts and pulled the treaty from Congress. The president sent former House Chair on Foreign Affairs, Senator James Blount, to Hawaii to investigate. Nearly a year later, Blount submitted his report to the president. At the end of 1893, President Cleveland addressed Congress. He described the actions of the United States as an act of war committed based on false pretexts. Cleveland cited the Law of Nations, which declared it unlawful for one nation to bring its military into another nation's territory without cause, and prohibited nations from harming the governments of other nations. Based on these facts, President Cleveland opposed annexing Hawaii to the United States. He urged Congress to restore Queen Liliuokalani to her proper authority. Despite the president's position, the provisional government refused to comply, and Congress refused to act and use force against them. The business interests that invented Hawaii's provisional government, now unrestrained by the U.S. Congress, defied international law. They installed Sanford B. Dole as their president and declared themselves the rulers of Hawaii, which they now call the Republic of Hawaii. The Republic of Hawaii did not emerge by the will of Hawaii's people. It was the creation of a handful of powerful businessmen who had no regard for the Hawaiian kingdom and its people. Liliuokalani was in a predicament. The Hawaiian kingdom had been seized by a handful of businessmen with the aid of the U.S. There was no clear immediate solution. The United States and its Congress were focused on expanding U.S. power in the Pacific. The United States Congress would not correct the unlawful acts of its representatives. And Liliuokalani would not risk lives nor the kingdom by ordering an armed conflict. 
the new U.S. President William McKinley pushed for U.S. expansion, and Hawaii sugar growers intensified their demands for annexation. However, a vast majority of the Hawaiian Kingdom opposed annexation. More than 38,000 people signed the Kuhe petitions. Most of them were native Hawaiians. These anti-annexation petitions had a significant impact on the U.S. Congress. After reviewing thousands of signatures against annexation, Lili'uokalani's protests, and the facts of the 1893 overthrow, the annexation treaty failed. Those who supported the annexation of Hawaii refused to give up. Instead, they pursued annexation through a resolution which required far fewer congressional votes. But this approach had no legitimacy, since resolutions only apply to matters within the United States. Congressman Thomas Ball of Texas argued, The annexation of Hawaii by a joint resolution is unconstitutional, a deliberate attempt to do unlawfully that which cannot be lawfully done. Despite this flawed approach, a resolution was passed and signed by Sanford B. Dole. However, Dole had no valid authority to hand the Hawaiian Islands over to the United States. But the U.S. proceeded as if the resolution was legal. On July 6, 1898, the United States claimed to have annexed Hawaii and assumed governance over the Hawaiian Islands and its population. With false authority, Dole transferred 1.8 million acres of crown lands and Hawaiian Kingdom government lands to the U.S. Despite the fact that the crown lands were the personal property of Queen Lili'uokalani, the government lands belonged to the Kingdom of Hawaii, and native Hawaiian Hoa'aina, or native tenants, retained rights to these lands. Clearly, these lands did not belong to the Republic or to Sanford Dole. The land was not theirs to transfer to anyone. Throughout her life, Queen Lili'uokalani and her people continued their diplomatic efforts in protest of the American invasion. Lili'uokalani passed away, never to see her kingdom restored or the wishes of her people fulfilled. Oh, 